Matthew chapter 19 and verse 1. Matthew 19 and verse 1. I'm reading from the King James. Follow along in the text before you. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee. And he came unto the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that which he made them? Uh, have ye not read that he, God, which made them at the beginning, made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away? And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery." His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it's not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were born from their mother's womb, and there were some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. We'll stop there. Give you an opportunity to confess all known sin before God the Father. Then ask that God might teach you and direct you as we study his word together. This is done in the secrecy of silent prayer. Father, our hearts are overjoyed. Every opportunity we can get together as men, joining with brothers in Christ, looking at your word and hearing you speak to us, teach us, direct us, and guide us as we study your word. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy in giving us this opportunity to be together. Bless each of the men so gathered here strengthening each one according to your will and your purpose. We pray that your Holy Spirit might be sensed in our midst, that we might realize his presence and might hear his still voice speaking to our hearts, that we might stand and be counted for you, being ambassadors for your Son, Jesus Christ, in all that we do and say. And Father, we pray all these things in that precious name, the name of Jesus. This we pray. Amen. We've been looking together at the pedagogy of the king. And pedagogy means teaching. Say it out loud. Pedagogy means teaching. Okay. I've been writing it in there. And I think it's about time where you can see the word and, and catch um, what it is. We're looking at the teachings. And so this whole section that we've been looking at from chapter 16 and through chapter 20, is Jesus teaching his disciples primarily those things that they need to know. And we've looked at the subject. He taught us about his church. He taught us about his death. He taught us about his glory, 
Um, then he taught us about his betrayal and his taxes. Last time we got together, he, he taught us about humility. And now he's going to address human problems. And I could have separated these out and made them separate points, but I thought it best to see it this way because they kind of can be lumped together. These are things that are difficulties that face an, an individual's life and can either be a source of a trip up or can be a source of strength. So um, concerning human problems, and we're going to be looking at divorce, we're going to be looking at children, and we're going to be looking at wealth and what God, um, particularly Christ, has to say about each one. We read the first uh, 12 verses, and I read again. It came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came unto the coasts of Judea, beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Jesus leaves Galilee, um, and as best we can tell, uh, you might want to look at it and see if you want to correct me or not, but I believe he is leaving Galilee for the last time. That when he walks out in this situation, this is it. He came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee. Um, and he went through the uh, region of Judea to the east side of the Jordan River. Um, that area, if you notice, he says here, beyond the Jordan. Beyond is the Greek word, pera. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that wasn't useful, was it? Let me do it in English letters. Um, it'd be like P-E-R-A-N. Peran is the word that is used in the text here that you read, or I read, as beyond. And so when they referred to that which is on the other side of the Jordan River, mind you, you've got the, the Sea of Galilee, then you've got the Jordan River, um, deep and cold, and then you've got the Dead Sea at the end. It's called dead because it doesn't have any exit. The water that goes into it stays there and uh, is uh, dried up by the sun. And so this area, just shy of the Dead Sea, okay, and up to the Sea of Galilee area, this area is referred to as Peran, which they're just simply saying beyond, outside on the other side of the Jordan River. Um, th this uh, particular um, area is referred to in a lot of your, your uh, books and such as Peria. Peria, um, just the land beyond. It's so often, as before, he was followed by large crowds of needy people. And each of those who came, who were ill and decrepit or in need of some sort of healing, Jesus willingly healed each of them, the multitudes. But some Pharisees sought to test Jesus through a question. Their question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? This was a hot topic over which the children of Israel were divided at this point in their history. There were two schools of thought, both of them. Um, rabbis went one way or went the other way. There didn't seem to be anyone that says, I don't know what it is. They all seem to take, a, take sides as to if a divorce is going to occur, can it be just for any old reason? Can it be um, for tedious things? She burned your um, your toast, you know? Um, or is there only um, given reasons? The whole thing was over a debate that was over the, the passage of Scripture in Deuteronomy 24, 
Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. Um, and you can be turning in your Bibles over to that passage. It's pretty key in the debate um, that was going on then. And, you know, it can have some ramifications even in the church today. In Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 1, Moses writes something very unusual here. And I want you to, you to appreciate the difficulties that are involved with this particular um, commandment or, or spoke, uh, speech on the subject of divorce. He says in verse 1, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. That settles, you know, it doesn't have to go to court, right? <laughs> um, it's his house and he just sent her out of it. Verse 2, And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Why? Because she has the bill of divorcement. Bill is the um, Hebrew word for scroll. Okay, she has a scroll of divorcement. Um, the Hebrews, even today, refer to that scroll as the get, G E T. Don't know why. It's just you would get, give her something, and it's a get out of here. I don't know what the get stands for. A get out of jail type. This allows her, when she has that in hand, to declare that she is no longer married um, to that guy, and now she can remarry. She can marry someone else. Verse 3 then says, If the latter or the second husband hate her, yeah, it says that, and write her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it to her hand, and sendeth her out of his house. Or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that she is defiled, for that is abomination before Jehovah, and thou shalt not cause the hand the land to sin, which Jehovah thy God giveth unto thee for an inheritance. Did you catch it? <clears throat> With a bill of divorcement in hand, she can remarry. If the second guy says later, and also gives her a bill of divorcement, she goes, wow, I'm starting to get a collection here. Um, she cannot go back to her first husband. If he says, ah, oh, don't worry about those things, I'll, I'll take you back. Isn't this all void and null? Anyway, with the New Testament, divorce is, is totally against the law, except for adultery, correct? I mean, this is, this is old stuff. Are you saying, is this applicable to this Baptist church or not? Right. Okay, not I'd have to say no. Exactly. This is the law. Right. So this doesn't pertain to, because the New Testament changed all that. Where the, you know, All right, but Jesus wasn't talking to people from Northwest Valley Baptist Church at the time. He's talking right. to a bunch of Jews, and they bring this matter. Now, does it look like there has to be a reason to get rid of this girl? There has to be a reason. Okay, from this text, what would you say that is? There is a phrase that gives you an inkling as to why he can get rid of her. The second one, all he has to do is hate her. Versus uncleanness. There you go. In verse one, if he, if because he hath found some uncleanness in her, what is that? This is why they're asking Jesus. This is a debate subject right now in in uh, Judaism in the first century. What is that? The word is ervoth dabar. Ervoth is simply the word for nakedness, um, shame. But it's also used for 
blemish. Okay? So I can say it's, and dabar is the word. So, um, the, he found a word of uncleanness, nakedness, shame, or blemish in her. He can get rid of her. What is that? Yeah, that's why they're asking Jesus. Because this is the big, the big debate that's going on present tense in first century Judaism. Uh, the followers of Hiel, um, and I should probably write that. Hillel was a very famous rabbi. He is considered a great rabbi. Uh, by the way, his son Gamaliel, uh, you know of from the book of Acts, okay? So Hillel, very, very famous um, from Oh boy, I'm, I'm doing my memory here, guys. So I think it's 130 BC to 10 AD that Hillel was teaching in Jerusalem. He believed that a you can divorce your wife because of this text in chapter 24. You can divorce your wife for any reason you want. I mean, if the second guy can say, I just hate the sight of her and he can give her a bill of divorce, that's sufficient. So, the debate goes on and says, even if she burns your toast in the morning, you can get rid of her, hand her a bill of divorce, a scroll of divorce, and that's sufficient. There was a second school that's going on. Um, the other rabbi's name was Shammai. And Shammai um, is living at the same time as Hillel, only he, like Hillel was a pretty old guy when Shammai came on the scene. And I think Shammai only goes to um, 30 AD, um, but he outlives him. But you have these two big schools of rabbinic teaching, and Hillel is saying anything goes. If you have any difficulty with her, just hand her a bill of divorcement. And Shammai says, oh, 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 only if you have a sexual offense against her. She has not been faithful to this marriage. Then she can divorce him. And he stepped one step further and said, and if she has an issue with her husband not being faithful to her, she likewise can give him a scroll of divorcement. The, but the issue is for Shammai, sexual um, infidelity and Hillel, whatever you want to come up with. Um, without getting involved in the Hillel Shammai um, debate, Jesus reminded the religious leaders of God's original purpose for establishing the marriage bond. Did you see how he did that? Pretty cool. Um, because they came in verse 3 saying, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? You don't know which side they're on on that. But they're just throwing him in and saying, Is Hillel right? And Jesus says in verse 4 we read, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he, God, which made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Therefore, they are no more twain, two people, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Jesus' stand on it, he completely skirt, stayed away from Deuteronomy. He hopped on board at Genesis chapter 1 when God made a male and female. And his intent for making um, male and female male, female. The intent 
for him making them male and female is not that a man shall live by himself, nor that a woman shall live by herself, but God's intent for Adam and Eve was for them to be one. And when a man marries a woman, they become one flesh, not two. Having fun talking earlier about, yeah, you go to the hospital and they don't let your wife come in. What is with this? How many of, of you are there? Well, they look with eyes from Satan's kingdom and said, oh, it is a male and a female, and we can separate them. When God looks at my, my wife and I, he sees one, one person. And so Jesus says, since they are no more twain, verse 6, they're one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And he cut the divorce question at the quick. He ended it. He didn't get to Deuteronomy on what, what's, how can you give a bill of divorce and, and not. Well, of course, not everyone thought that was fair. Okay, man made male and female. Chapter 1, verse 27 of Genesis. In marriage, he joins them together and he looks at them as an inseparable bond. This bond is even stronger. Listen to me. The bond of marriage is even stronger than the parent-child relationship. For a man is to leave his father and his mother and be joined unto his wife in a one flesh relationship. Do you see that? That's Genesis chapter 2 verse 24. Hasn't even got to Deuteronomy yet, has he? Didn't need to. Therefore, what God hath joined together, says Jesus, men ought not to separate. That word separate is korizeo. Um, and it is considered divorce in most of the Greek writings. If you look over at um, 1 Corinthians, if you got a quick moving Bible, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Oh, oh I just wished we could go into this whole chapter. Um, verse 10 and unto the married I command yet not I but the Lord let not the wife depart there's that word Chorizo, that's being translated as divorce in the other text let her not be separated from her husband wow can you use that at the hospital well but if she depart let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Let not the husband put away his wife. Pretty strong words in regards to the power of uh, a marriage, according to Scripture. The Pharisees, realizing that Jesus was looking at this a little bit different and didn't get on board with, with the subject matter in Deuteronomy, um, they asked, well then... Why did Moses make a provision for divorce for people in this day? Do you see that in verse 7? Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, a scroll of divorcement, and to put her away? They think they've got him now. But of course, <coughs> the Lord's answer was that Moses granted per this permission because the hearts of the people were hard like a rock. Um, just see, do you notice this? He doesn't say um, in verse 8, And he saith unto them, God, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. Oh! Your Bible doesn't say that, does it? No. Jesus, the Son of God, gives Moses credit for this silly bill of divorcement. 
and does not bear it over to the Lord God himself. God, he says, made you male and female for the purpose of making you one. What he puts together, don't you separate. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, allow, suffered you, um, gave in to you, allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. From the hardness of your heart. Actually, literally, it says, um, not because your hearts were very hard, it says, um, toward the hardness of your heart, he did that. He is seeing the hardness within your heart, and therefore he gives you this bill of, of divorcement. And the word that he uses there is a um, pretty interesting word. Oops, I'm running out of places to put these kind of things. He uses the word here, talking about the hardness of their heart, as, um, do it in English, sclero car Nian. Can you read Greek? Sclero cardian. Okay. Um, I think you really could if I gave you enough time to work on that. Because if you have this, it comes into our, our language. Sclerosis means a hardening. The tissue gets hard and unpliable. Sclerosis. Sclero. See that? And cardian, okay, uh, gives us our word cardiac, right? Which is speaking of the heart. Hard, uh, a hardness of the heart. But that wasn't God's intention for marriage to have a bill of divorcement. God intended husbands and wives to live together permanently. Now, I hasten to say, I do understand that for many of you, the word divorce is an emotive word. And to speak of the subject of divorce doesn't work with your head or your understanding of scripture, it works more with your emotions. Well, you didn't know her. You know, some people, it's their parents. Mom and dad went through divorce and you went through the lonely times. Dad wasn't around. It was horrid. Um, and so divorce, emotional word, right? Not something you can discuss. Um, maybe you've gone through, maybe your kids have gone through divorce. And once again, there's an ouch that is dealt with when we look at the word divorce. But if you'll just give me a moment to leave it with Jesus, what does he say? God never intended for divorce ever to happen, ever. His plan is this, a man and woman, and they become one for eternity, for life, actually for life, until death do them part and they remain in this condition. They do not separate. Um, every one of us, if you've, been, if you've been married for any length of time, there's been a time within your minds that you've said, oh, my soul, what did I do? Was I, this isn't going to work. And it may be on the other side. It may not be that you're faulting her for anything, but you may be faulting yourself and say, I'm a loser. This isn't working. I'm trying to get these things to go. And, and so the question of, should I stay married or not? Keep this in your mind. For a believer in Jesus Christ, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, divorce is never Never 
an option. You can read through the, the Hebrews um, uh, devotional works and, the, and their studies of their scripture and such, and there's different times. Um, to the Jews, if uh, one of you get leprosy, the other one can divorce you, bill a divorcement. And if the person says, no, I don't want to, the, the, the rabbis and the, and the synagogue authorities write the bill of divorcement and hand it to the woman and say, oh, we don't want you to have le leprosy as well. There are times they force divorce upon individuals in the Jewish faith. But in the Christian faith, read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, 1 Corinthians, that is not an R. This is an R. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, and you will see divorce isn't an option. Well, if you if a woman trusts in Christ as Lord and Savior and her husband is still lost, the Bible says she should continue to live with him in hopes to winning him to Christ. But if he will not, then she is to let him go. But she is to remain unmarried. Okay? So marriage is very serious in the New Testament. So when you want to get it to the Northwest Valley Baptist, it's a very serious thing, not done lightly. Um, it is not easy um, to find scripture to justify um, leaving a spouse. Never an option. Oh, look over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. We, we saw this as we were coming through the, um, earlier in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31. <clears throat> it hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Jesus is saying, this is what the Jewish faith says. But look at what he, how he answers that. Verse 32. But I, Jesus, say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her, that is, divorce, committeth adultery. He divorces her because she burned his toast. He has made her an adulteress, according to what Jesus said, not according to what Craig Averill said. Jesus says, you have caused her to commit adultery. She should not be in that situation because she is one with you. And he says, whosoever shall marry her in that condition, that is divorced, that person committeth adultery. Now, I know these are strong statements and some of you may be thinking in the back of your mind, wish I heard this earlier, um, <laughs> kind of late in the road for me to be catching all this good teaching. Um, but that's sad because too often um, ministers will perform weddings and they won't even tell the person what they're doing. That they are becoming one and cannot separate. Well, they got to have premarital counseling. Yes, yeah. which is very crucial. I just shut down my court business uh, back in July. Sure. I have served thousands of divorce papers over the last 30, 35 years. And Arizona is a no-fault divorce state. All you need to get a divorce here is the $90 for the filing fee. You don't need a reason? And your spouse has no recourse. Well, no, nobody has a recourse either way. So. Well, see, when I was growing up in Illinois, if someone filed for divorce, the other person could say no and enjoin the, that the judge would say, no, this divorce will not be granted. You had to prove infidelity or something. Right. But not anymore, not in Arizona. It's Hillel here in, in um, Arizona. Thank you. Yes. Okay, Russ. I thought that Arizona instituted another kind of marriage, though, where you did have to have that. Well, well you, you can do a covenant marriage where yeah. two Christians get together and say, we're going to get married under the covenant rule. Then you can't just... The rules are, there's you no, sign something, you can't yeah. just get a divorce. There's, there's no, but no, that, that's no rare. Most people don't get married that way. Yeah. It's called the covenant marriage. Look at verse 9. Jesus says, And I say unto you, 
Whosoever shall put away his wife, except for fornication, shall marry other, marry another, committeth adultery. So now it's pointing out to the person who is doing the divorce papers. Okay, If he divorces her, and then he wants to remarry, it's adultery. It's just naturally adultery. And whosoever marrieth her, which has been put away, also commits adultery. So in that couple, by divorce papers, are separated. No matter who marries them, they're an adulterer or adulteress. And they, these two people, are adulterers and adulteresses as well. Very strong um, in the teaching. Except, in the book of Matthew, you have this, except it be for fornication. By the way, in Mark, in Luke, there is no exception clause whatsoever. It just says, point out. But Matthew recorded that Jesus said, except be for fornication. Great. That leaves us Christians with three schools where the Jews only had two schools. Mm -hmm. We have three schools of thought because of that one word, pornia, pornia. Um, some feel Jesus used pornia as a synonym for adultery. And the word for adultery is moichao. It's a different word altogether. Um, therefore, adultery by either partner in marriage is the only sufficient grounds to terminate a marriage. Among whose holding these views, some believe that remarriage is possible in such cases. Other churches hold that marriage should never occur person is unfaithful and divorce papers are given and the unfaithful member is separated from the faithful one it is divorce some churches say well you can remarry after that situation or others say no um, you cannot others define here's the second school others define pornia as a sexual offense that can only occur prior to marriage, which a Jewish man and a Jewish woman were betrothed, but they hadn't consummated their marriage with sexual intercourse. If in this particular period, lasting 12 months, a woman was found pregnant, a bill of divorce should be given in order to break that contract. Also, the option was in Jewish circles, you could have that woman put stoned to death. But at this particular time, it was more customary to give her a bill of divorce and quietly put her away. This is precisely of Mary and Joseph. In Matthew chapter uh, 1, in this very book, chapter 1, um, starting with verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, during that one year waiting period of a spousal, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. He was going to quietly give her a bill of divorcement and then maybe move to another town or something so that there wouldn't be any that's how um, others look at this word pornia, this fornication. And the third way of looking at that word fornication in the church today is still others believe that that refers to an illegitimate marriage. Um, that he was talking about something that occurs more than like, more often in Jewish weddings. That is, a person is married um, and it is against the law that those two individuals be married. Um, Leviticus chapter 18. Um, Leviticus chapter 18, verses 6 through 18, if you want to uh, look at that. Leviticus 18, um, 6 through 18, gives a whole list of different things. 
basically it's like incest, brother and sister, first cousins, um, a father and his daughter. These kind of incestual relationships. If an individual <coughs> marries a woman and they sit down and they're going through the genealogy chart um, <laughs> for their family photos and such, and they find out we're first cousins. They believe that that would be considered fornication and simply a writ bill is all you have to have and you can be separated. Um, and that is, by the way, how it is used in Acts chapter 15. Um, yeah, about everything is covered somewhere. Acts chapter 15 and verse 20. Acts 15, verse 20. But we write unto you um, them that abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Look down in verse 29. That ye abstain from the meats offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from fornication, from which ye keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare thee well. Um, that that's possibly the pornea that they're talking about, marriage that was inappropriate. And that would happen in Corinth among pagans, and then they get married, and then they become Christians, and then they reevaluate their marriage um, vows because they are brother and sister um, more than just in Christ. And 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication, pornia, among you. Such pornia as is not among the named among Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. There in the church of Corinth, pornia in action. This is an immoral marriage between a, a son and his mother. And uh, he deals with it. And finally, you realize they, by the second book, that they had actually um, dealt with that and the family um, had repented and pulled out of that. Can I, uh, can I make one yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, you and I both sat under Dr. Richard Jackson. Yes, sir. Dr. Richard Jackson, I thought, wisely stated one time, I heard him say this, if there's divorce, there's sin somewhere. And sin is still forgivable. Mm -hmm. And you can go on. Yes. Uh, yes. There's sin somewhere. A lot of people treat it as the unpardonable sin, but it is for forgivable. Right. It is forgivable. But there are consequences. Yes. Just as if you cut off your arm, you may repent of losing your left arm, but there are consequences with having only one arm. Do you understand? And if divorce occurs, there of course is forgiveness. It's usually the children who separate the father. But Jesus says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife except for fornication shall marry another, committeth adultery. There is, there is response to this. Whosoever marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So, I gave you three different directions, but whatever view you take on this subject of what is that fornication that's, that he's talking about there, the exception, Jesus obviously affirmed the permanency of marriage. Those who heard his words understood him in this way. For they reasoned that if there's no grounds for divorce, whoa, a man would be better not getting married, not putting himself in this awkward position. Celibacy was not what God had intended in this whole scene, for he had given marriage to people for their betterment. Genesis chapter um, 2 and verse 18. It was not right that they be separated. It was 
for their betterment, for their right, uh, the right thing to do for them to be married. Marriage should be a deterrent to lustful sin, uh, to unfaithfulness, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 2 again. But there are some who either do not have strong sexual desires or they were born eunuchs or uh, born in a castrated condition. Are they able to control those desires for the furtherance of God's program here on earth? He makes that statement. For there are some eunuchs. The word eunuch doesn't mean castrated, okay? Um, we take it often just as that. The word eunuch is actually a house, literally, a bed servant. Someone who could serve in the bedroom of the lady, okay? And so, like in the case of Daniel and other things, they often would be um, made eunuchs so that nothing uh, untoward would occur. And that's what he's talking about on the second. Some were made eunuchs by men. And there be those who are eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Um, I served on the mission field. And on that mission field, several of the ladies that I knew had never been married. They said, you know, Bible college, uh, training, uh, training for, for mission work, cross-cultural mission work stuff on the field. She said, I just never got around to dating like like other of the girls um, that that I know, and I never felt like I really needed to uh, go date. There are those who are in that condition, and Jesus points that out. Um, he that's able to receive it, let him receive it. Um, he leaves it up to the individual, not to any outside source. And then a short section on the subject. Oh, by the way, while I'm still with divorce, um, the late Ruth Bell Graham, Billy Graham's wife, um, after his death, she was asked um, if she ever com contemplated divorcing her husband, ever contemplated divorcing Billy Graham. And her answer was, divorce? No. No. Murder, yes. <laughs> and second, we look at children. Children, very short section, but um, we need to touch on it. When there were, verse 13, when there were brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray and the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. We have dealt with this word, little children, paidon, uh, previously. It is a neuter word. It just means child. It doesn't say it's a little boy, a little girl, but it's a little child. Um, what's a little child? A little child has been defined as one who can go in the bathroom and wash their hands and the soap remains dry. That's a little child. You got the picture. You've had them in your house, probably. Many parents were bringing children to Jesus. Little children. Not big bruisers. Little children. And they were asking him to place his hands upon them and pray for them, to bless them. But the disciples felt this was a waste of Jesus' time. They began rebuking those bringing children. Apparently, the disciples had already forgotten what Jesus had said earlier about the worth of children and the seriousness of causing them to fall. Remember last time in chapter 18, verses 1 through 14? Jesus rebukes, sets straight his disciples, telling them, let the little children come, not to hinder them. The kingdom of heaven is not limited to adults who might be considered to be worth more than these kids. Anyone who comes to the Lord in faith is a worthy subject for the kingdom uh, of God. This implies that Jesus had time for all of the children. When we read this in the Greek, it's very clear. He took the time for each 
child individually, according to the Greek that's used here. For he didn't depart from the region until every mom was smiling. He had blessed every single one of those children. Charles Francis Adams, grandson of President John Adams, son of President John Quincy Adams. He was a highly successful U.S. congressman and he was our U.S. ambassador to England during the time of the Civil War. This man kept meticulous diaries. Every day, carefully, he wrote down what was going on. You can buy them on eBay, but you'll only buy a portion of them. You might be able to pick up uh, volumes one and two. You might be able to pick up volumes five or eight. But this thing is humongous. It's the size of an encyclopedia. His diary. Um, and he made entries every single day. Interesting, one of his entries was this. I'm quoting him. Went fishing with my son today. A day wasted. His son, Brooke Adams, who likewise became a very successful guy, also following in his dad's footsteps, kept very meticulous diary. And we can compare the two and go to that very same day. And Brooke Adams, his diary likewise, you can, you can purchase. His entry for that very same day was, went fishing with my father the most wonderful day of my life. The father thought he was wasting time while he was fishing with his son, but the son saw it, well, as you see it, investment of time. What do you think? Wasting time or investing? One needs to know what is the ultimate purpose. God gives us children. What's our ultimate purpose as a father? Guide them to the Lord. And then live accordingly. And then third and finally, I'll close with this. Wealth. Verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he saith unto him, Which? <laughs> and Jesus, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man saith unto him, all these I've kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that which thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And said Jesus unto the disciples, Verily I say unto you, that the rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard this, they were exceedingly amazed. Who then can be saved? And Jesus beheld them and said, With men... This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. This man that comes to Jesus, we hear a lot um, from the scriptures of what he was like. In verse 20, in this text, we see that he was young. In verse 22, it declares that he was wealthy, had a great number of possessions. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 17, we learn that he is a ruler, which 
of course, anytime that happens. Um, oh, excuse me. I gave you the wrong text. Um, he was a ruler, but that was Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And some discussion goes on in, in that passage. And many come out of that saying, you know, I think he was a Sanhedrin. I think he was all the way up to the top, this young guy. And Mark chapter 10 that I mentioned before, verse 17, tells us he was healthy. How do I say that? He ran to Jesus, dropped on the ground before him, and said, good master, good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? He wanted to know what work was necessary for eternal life. If I'm going to secure eternal life, what things ought I to do? Jesus replies, there's only one who is good. The word that the boy used is agathos, and that is a word for intrinsic goodness, goodness completely. And he called him good master, and, he, and Jesus throws it back at him with the question, God is the only one that is really intrinsically good. Are, is that what you're saying about me? And I think there's actually a pause um, in verse 17. That's a Craig Averill, okay? Craig Averill interpretation is that Jesus said it like this. Why callest thou me, Agathos, good? There is none good but one, that is God. Pause. Nothing happens. Then Jesus says, but if thou wilt enter into life, you really want eternal life, keep the commandments. I believe he gave him an opportunity for a response. You, are you saying I'm God? Okay, if you want eternal life, then keep the commandments. What's that going to do? Just, just, show him he can. just show him that he's got sin in his life and he needs to repent of that sin. Exactly. Anytime you try to keep... The law was never meant for salvation. The law was meant to show sin within our life that we would repent of that sin and turn to the Savior, turn to the Lord. And so he gives him that opportunity. When the man doesn't reply, Jesus indicates eternal life can be entered into if you give evidence of that righteousness. Are you? Can you keep the laws? Since the official standard of righteousness was the law of Moses... Jesus told the man to obey the commandments. Does salvation come through the law? Absolutely not. But the law of God turns a light on. It reveals our sin. Um, The ruler immediately asks, which ones? Now, he's not being a Smartenheimer. I think this is a, a genuine question. Because are you saying the laws of Moses? Are you saying the laws of the Pharisees that they're, that they're giving us? Um, what, which laws are, what are we looking at here um, for, for that fulfillment? So he's asking which ones? And Jesus replies by, rece- by repeating several of the commandments. Uh, commandments 5 through 9. These were on the second tablet of the Ten Commandments. Basically, they were commandments that had to do with one-on-one behavior because that's where this man had difficulty, the interacting with other people. And then he slides in another one from the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 9, 9, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's not found in the Ten Commandments. So he gives him several of the commands and then love your neighbor as yourself. This should be enough light on the man's need. For he didn't care about others. He cared only for himself. But the man comes out and affirms, I've kept all those things from my youth on up. I've... What else do I lack? Verse 20. Whether he had truly kept those commands, I'm a little skeptical. But those, um, God, only God would really, really know if he has kept these things. But look at verse 21, precious. Jesus says to him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell what thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure 
in heaven and come follow me. If you would be perfect, who's perfect? Jesus. Okay, only Jesus. Um, but the, is Jesus suggesting that this good guy could actually be perfect? Um, well, the word that he's using there, teleos, is is the word that means in the Greek language complete in all the parts. It's finished. It doesn't need anything to be added to it. Um, listen to me. A watch is perfect or it's complete when he has all the proper gears and wheels and such, right? The hands, the casement, every, all of that is in order. Um, then um, it's perfect. And that's the perfect he's talking about. If you want everything together, well, the young man had believed he'd fulfilled these commands, yet he knew something was missing. And Jesus put his finger right on the problem. Sell your possessions. Give it to the poor. And then have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Why did Jesus tell him to sell all and give to the poor? Is this how a man gets saved? No. But this commandment pointed to this particular man's real problem. He was covetous. His salvation doesn't come to this man. Uh, salvation doesn't come to any man that will not confess his sin. This young, healthy, wealthy ruler would not confess his sinfulness. This man turned his back and he walked away sad rather than confess his sin. Verse 22, we read, But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. His unwillingness to relinquish his wealth showed that he didn't love his neighbor as himself. Thus, he had not kept those commandments he claimed that he did. He lacked salvation. Nothing more was written about this man ever again. He loved his money more than his God. And thus, he violated even the first commandment. Exodus 20, verse 3, love God more than anything else. And we, curl, and we close. Uh, I, I've read them already. Jesus said to his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again I say, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. And this is literal. He's talking about the biggest animal in the Middle East, the camel. And he's talking about the littlest aperture that's known to these people, the eye of a needle. Possibility? Zero unless God pulls something like that off, which he says to them. Um, when the disciples heard this, they were amazed. They said, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Who then can be saved? This shows the Pharisees' influence on them. For the Pharisees said, God bestows wealth on those he loves. So if a Wealthy person can't make it into the kingdom. Wow, who can? Jesus said salvation isn't dependent upon man's ability. Salvation is a work of God alone. What appears to be impossible with men, God delights to do. Father, thank you so much for the salvation that you've given to us through your son, Jesus Christ. We know we don't deserve it, but we're very, very grateful for it nonetheless. And we give you praise and thanks and ask that you might guide us and direct us as we go from this place. Help us to be good husbands. Help us to be men of God. Help us to be fathers that love their children. These things we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.